What if I told you there's an engine that ran for 70 years straight, powered everything from city buses to Sherman tanks, and refused to die no matter how hard you tried to kill it? 238 horsepower, two-stroke diesel, six cylinders. These numbers don't sound impressive today, but they represent one of the most indestructible pieces of engineering America ever produced. Picture this. It's 1938, and General Motors just created something that would outlive its designers, their children, and probably their grandchildren. The Detroit Diesel 671 wasn't supposed to be revolutionary. It was supposed to be reliable. What happened next shocked everyone, including the engineers who built it. This is the story of the Detroit Diesel 671, an engine so ridiculously overbuilt that examples are still running today with over 5 million miles on them, not rebuilt, original, still making power after watching the world change around them for three quarters of a century. To understand why this engine became legendary, we need to travel back to the late 1930s. America was climbing out of the Great Depression. Cities were modernizing their transportation systems. The military was quietly preparing for a war everyone knew was coming and diesel technology was still in its relative infancy for mobile applications. The diesel engines of that era were massive, heavy, and complicated. A comparable gasoline engine might weigh 800 pounds. The diesel equivalent often tipped the scales at 2,000 pounds or more. They were industrial monsters designed for stationary applications, not vehicles that needed to move. Charles Kettering, the genius behind the electric starter, and countless other innovations, was running GM's research division. He had a problem. GM owned Yellow Coach, which built buses, and those buses were burning through gasoline at an alarming rate. A typical city bus got maybe four miles per gallon. With thousands of buses running across America, the fuel costs were astronomical. But here's where it gets interesting. Kettering didn't just want a diesel engine. He wanted something completely different. While everyone else was building four-stroke diesels, following Rudolf Diesel's original design, Kettering decided to go with a two-stroke. In a four-stroke engine, you get one power stroke for every two revolutions of the crankshaft. In a two-stroke, you get one power stroke for every single revolution. Twice the power pulses, theoretically, twice the power from the same displacement. The problem? Two-stroke diesels were notoriously difficult to make work properly. The same ports that let exhaust out also had to let fresh air in, all in the fraction of a second between power strokes. Get the timing wrong by even a few degrees, and the engine either wouldn't run or would destroy itself trying. GM's solution was elegant and bulletproof. Instead of relying on crankcase pressure like a traditional two-stroke, they bolted a gear-driven roots blower directly to the engine. This supercharger, because that's essentially what it was, forced fresh air into the cylinders at exactly the right moment, pushing out exhaust gases and providing clean air for the next combustion cycle. The 71 and 671 referred to the displacement per cylinder, 71 cubic inches. Multiply that by six cylinders and you got 426 cubic inches total. In metric terms, that's just about seven liters. The engine used unit injection, meaning each cylinder had its own fuel injector driven by a camshaft. No common rail, no high pressure fuel pump, just six individual injection pumps doing their own thing. The specifications were conservative but purposeful. Bore and stroke measured 4.25 inches each, a perfectly square engine design. Compression ratio sat at 17.1, enough to ensure reliable ignition, but not so high that it stressed components unnecessarily. The engine redlined at just 2100 RPM. Maximum torque, 460 pound-feet, arrived at 2200 RPM and stayed flat until harnessed 600 RPM. But wait, there's more. The 671 wasn't just one engine. It was a modular system. Need less power? Pull off two cylinders and you had a 471. Need more? Add two cylinders for an 8 to 71. The parts were interchangeable. A piston from a 371 would fit perfectly in a 1271. This wasn't just clever engineering. 
it was manufacturing genius. The first production 671 engines rolled off the line in 1938. They weighed 2,075 pounds dry, heavy but not outrageous for a diesel of that era. GM immediately put them in yellow coach buses and something remarkable happened. They just kept running. Where gasoline bus engines needed rebuilds every 50,000 miles, the 671s were hitting 200,000 miles without major service. Operators were stunned. The fuel economy jumped from 4 miles per gallon to nearly 7, a 75% improvement. The engines were loud, sure. That distinctive Detroit diesel scream became the soundtrack of every American city. But they were unstoppable. Then came December 7, 1941, Pearl Harbor. America entered World War II, and suddenly the military needed engines, lots of them. The 671 was perfect, reliable, relatively lightweight for a diesel, and already in mass production. The engine went into everything. Sherman tanks used twin 671s coupled together to create the GM 6046, essentially a 12-cylinder monster pushing out 375 horsepower. Landing craft used them. Generators, pumps, basically anything that needed reliable power in combat conditions got a Detroit diesel. Here's the kicker. The military didn't baby these engines. They ran them in African desert heat, Russian winter cold, Pacific island humidity. They fed them contaminated fuel, ignored maintenance schedules, and generally abused them in ways that would kill any normal engine. The 671s kept running. One tank crew reported running their Sherman for 72 hours straight during the Battle of the Bulge. No stops except for refueling. The temperature hit minus 20 Fahrenheit. The engines never missed a beat. Another report from the Pacific described a landing craft taking direct fire that punctured the oil pan. The crew stuffed the hole with rags and kept going. The engine ran another six hours before they could properly repair it. The engineering that made this possible was deceptively simple. The 671 used a gear train instead of a timing chain. Gears don't stretch, don't need adjustment, and rarely fail. The blower was driven directly off this gear train, no belts to break. The fuel injectors were mechanical, operated by a simple rack and pinion system. If one injector failed, you could cap off the fuel line and run on five cylinders. The cooling system was massively overbuilt. The water pump could move 115 gallons per minute, enough to drain a typical home hot water heater in 30 seconds. The oil pump was equally ridiculous, circulating 16 gallons per minute through passages that were deliberately oversized to prevent clogging. Let me put that in perspective. A modern car engine might circulate five gallons of oil per minute. The 671 with less than half the displacement of a big block V8 was moving three times as much oil. It was lubrication overkill and it worked. The cylinder liners were replaceable wet sleeves. When they wore out, which took forever because they were made from hardened cast iron, you could pop them out and slide in new ones. The engine block itself never wore out. It was just a housing for replaceable components. The head design was equally brilliant. Each cylinder had its own individual head held down by four massive bolts. Blow a head gasket? You replaced one small gasket, not a massive one spanning all six cylinders. Crack a head? Replace just that one. The parts cost was minimal, the labor time even less. After the war, these engines found their way into everything. Fishing boats, generators, pumps, construction equipment, buses, trucks, even custom hot rods. The 671 became the small block Chevy of the diesel world, everywhere, adaptable, and supported by an enormous aftermarket. Gray Marine started marinizing them for boats. The Navy loved them so much they standardized on the 671 for everything from patrol boats to auxiliary generators on battleships. Commercial fishermen discovered they could run them at wide open throttle for days on end during salmon season. The engines didn't care. The truly insane part? Detroit Diesel kept improving them without changing the basic design. In 1957, 
they introduced the N-Series with improved cooling and stronger internals. Power jumped to 238 horsepower. In 1973, the turbo version appeared, pushing 295 horsepower from the same basic architecture. But here's where the story gets really wild. These engines developed a reputation for being literally unkillable. Stories started circulating that seemed impossible. A construction company in Alaska reported a 671 that had run continuously for 11 years straight, only stopping for oil changes. Total hours? Over 96,000. That's equivalent to driving 2.8 million miles at highway speeds. A fishing boat captain in Louisiana claimed his 6 to 71 had never been rebuilt in 40 years of commercial fishing. When Detroit Diesel heard about it, they sent engineers to investigate. The engine had over 3 million miles on it. The cylinder bores still showed the original crosshatch pattern from the factory hone. The engineers couldn't explain it. The secret was in the two-stroke design itself. Every revolution was a power stroke, but that also meant every revolution got fresh oil. The cylinder walls were constantly being lubricated. The roots blower provided positive scavenging, blowing carbon deposits out before they could build up. The lower peak cylinder pressures, compared to a four-stroke, meant less stress on components. The maintenance was stupidly simple. Change the oil every 10,000 miles or 250 hours. Adjust the valves and injectors every 50,000 miles. Replace the blower seals every 100,000 miles. That was it. No timing chains to replace, no complex valve trains to maintain, no high-pressure fuel systems to worry about. The sound became iconic. That screaming supercharger, the sharp bark of the exhaust, the mechanical symphony of gears and injectors. You could identify a Detroit diesel from a mile away. Bus drivers called it the screaming jimmy. Hot rodders who turbocharged them called them buzz and dozen when they built V-12 versions. The military kept using them through Vietnam, where they powered everything from generators to river patrol boats. The swift boats that patrolled the Mekong Delta ran twin 671s. They'd run them hard through narrow rivers, bouncing off sandbars, sucking in muddy water, taking small arms fire. The engines survived it all. The numbers speak for themselves. Between 1938 and 1995, when production finally ended, Detroit Diesel built over 3,071 series engines, not just 671s, but the entire family, from 1 to 71 single cylinders to massive 2471 V24 monsters. The 671 was the most popular, with over a million units produced. Think about that for a second. One basic engine design produced for 57 years with only minor improvements. In an industry where engine families rarely last a decade, the 71 series lasted over half a century. The competition couldn't match it. Cummins tried with their NH series. CAT had their 3208. Both were good engines, but neither had the simplicity or the proven reliability of the 671. When you needed an engine that absolutely positively had to run no matter what, you bought a Detroit. The aftermarket went insane with these engines. Banks Engineering figured out how to twin turbocharge them, pushing over 500 horsepower from 426 cubic inches. Drag racers discovered that with enough boost, they could make 1,000 horsepower. The blocks held together. The bottom ends survived. These engines that were designed for 238 horsepower were handling four times that amount. Marine applications pushed them even harder. Offshore racing boats would run them at 2,800 RPM, 700 RPM over redline, for hours. The engines would scream like banshees, glowing red hot and keep pulling. When they finally failed, it was usually a thrown rod from the sustained overspeed, not a design flaw. So what was actually going wrong? When 671s did fail, it was almost always operator error or complete neglect. Run them without oil, they'd seize, forget to change the air filters in dusty conditions, the blower would eat itself. But given even basic maintenance, they seemed immortal. The rebuild process was equally impressive. A complete in-frame rebuild, new liners, pistons, bearings, and gaskets 
could be done in a day by a competent mechanic. The parts were everywhere and relatively cheap. A rebuilt 671 was essentially a new engine. Shops reported rebuilding the same engines multiple times over decades, with the original block and crankshaft still in perfect condition. The environmental regulations of the 1990s finally killed production. The 671 couldn't meet the new emission standards without extensive modifications that would have ruined its simplicity. Detroit Diesel moved on to the Series 60, a modern four-stroke that was cleaner and more fuel efficient. But here's the thing about 671s, they're still everywhere. Every major city has buses running Detroit diesels from the 1960s. Thousands of commercial fishing boats still rely on them. Generator sets at hospitals and data centers still have 6 to 71s as emergency backups. They're grandfathered in under emissions laws, too valuable to replace. The parts supply remains robust. You can still buy every single component brand new. Aftermarket companies make improved versions of everything from pistons to blowers. The knowledge base is enormous. Every diesel mechanic over 40 knows how to work on them. The modern perspective makes the 671 even more impressive. Today's engines are technological marvels. Common rail injection, variable geometry turbos, complex emission systems. They're more powerful, cleaner, and more efficient than anything from the 71 series era. But they're also exponentially more complex. A modern diesel has dozens of sensors, multiple computer modules, and thousands of potential failure points. When something goes wrong, you need a laptop and diagnostic software. When a 671 has issues, you need a wrench and basic mechanical knowledge. The military still rebuilds 671s for certain applications. Why? because in remote locations where computers and diagnostic tools aren't available, a mechanical engine that can be fixed with basic tools is invaluable. The simplicity that made them obsolete for civilian use makes them perfect for austere conditions. Collectors have started hoarding them. Clean, running 671s, now sell for $5,000 to $15,000 depending on condition. That's more than they cost new adjusted for inflation. People are pulling them out of junked buses and boats, rebuilding them, and storing them like gold bars. They know these engines will outlast anything built today. Let that sink in for a moment. An engine designed when Hitler was still in power, before jet planes, before computers, before anyone had walked on the moon, is still running daily service in the 21st century. Not as museum pieces, but as working engines earning their keep. The Detroit Diesel 671 represents something we've lost in modern engineering. It wasn't the most powerful, wasn't the most efficient, wasn't the quietest or smoothest, but it was the most dependable piece of machinery ever bolted into a vehicle. It was engineering focused on one goal, survive everything and keep running. In an age where we accept that engines need major service at 100,000 miles, where we trade reliability for efficiency and emissions, the 6 to 71 stands as a monument to a different philosophy. Build it right. Build it simple. Build it to last forever. Then let it scream its way through decades of abuse and neglect, never stopping, never dying. Just doing its job day after day, year after year, decade after decade. The last new 671 rolled off the production line in 1995. That engine is probably still running somewhere, adding to the legend. And in 2095, a hundred years after it was built, it'll probably still be running. Because that's what Detroit diesels do. They run forever. What's the oldest working engine you've ever encountered? Drop a comment below and share your Detroit diesel stories. If you enjoyed this deep dive into one of America's most indestructible engines, make sure to subscribe for more legendary engineering stories. Until then, keep those engines running especially if they're screaming jimmies.